Boardroom Bound, Episode 84, A New Perspective on the Board Director Search, with Jacob Stengel. On a scale from one to five, how aligned are you as a board uh, on the company strategy? I never saw anyone score less than five. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Boardroom Bound. My name is Alexander Lowry, and this is the podcast dedicated to intentional leadership in the boardroom. My goal is to give aspiring and existing directors the tips, tactics, and strategies necessary to transform your confidence and build a successful career as a board director. Quick reminder, you can get all of today's show notes at podcast.gordon.edu. And in today's episode, I'm delighted to welcome Jacob Stengel joining us all the way from Copenhagen, as if he was sitting right here next to me. And Jacob has had an illustrious career in the board space. So he is at, I think, the ninth biggest international executive search firm. He leads their board practice, and he works with companies around the world. He is one of the leading experts on board evaluation, so figuring out whether the board is in the right place to do the work they need to now. And then, of course, figuring out the board seats that need to be filled and being the consultant around that. And he will peel back the onion for us about what it looks like, what it feels like to work with an executive search firm, how to do it in the right way. And he'll also give some amazing tips at the end for how you can position yourself to be the kind of person who's on their radar. Let's jump into the show. I'm really excited for this content for you today. Jacob Stengel, welcome to the Boardroom Bound podcast. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Well, it was fun. We were just talking about before we went live that uh, it's a small world. You're in Copenhagen. I was sharing how I used to go there once a year. Loved it. Phenomenal city and delighted that technology allows us to be as if we were sitting together, which uh, the way that the world has changed and the new normal that we're in, people are having these sort of conversations more regularly on Zoom chats around the world these days. So I guess it's becoming more normal, but it, it still isn't lost on me, the magic. And I'm delighted that we can build off of your incredible background and experience today and share that with our audience. Uh, because to me, in, in many ways, you are probably what we would talk about as one of sort of the leading search and uh, search expert perspectives on what it means to be doing well in the corporate governance space. And that is what you guys are really focused on and known for as a firm. But you as an individual, when someone pulls up your LinkedIn profile, it sort of explodes boardroom knowledge from the, you know, the 10 different corporate boards that you've been on and the multiple organizations that you founded around this that are involved in this space. So this is going to be great fun to talk through today. But perhaps we could just start by building the scene setting for our audience, for them to understand how you got to the position that you're in today and probably how you fell in love with the boardroom area. Uh, well, I'm happy to share that. Thank you. Um, I guess, you know, I started out, I trained as a lawyer, so I have a master's degree in law. Uh, and then I, uh, a little bit by coincidence, I, I entered the world of uh, financial services. So I joined uh, AIG uh, and headed up their uh, department for financial uh, insurance products, uh, IPO insurance, M&A insurance, but the most important product at that time was definitely uh, the directors and officers liability insurance. Mm -hmm. And that kind of uh, founded the basis for me to not only uh, get access to a lot of uh, the different boards at that time. We're talking about uh, 1998, 1999. Uh, but it was also at a time where AIG was sponsoring uh, New York Stock Exchange uh, on a corporate governance project. And that kind of drilled down on, all over the organization um, uh, throughout the world, uh, including uh, Little Denmark uh, and, and Copenhagen. Uh, so that was kind of my first uh, glimpse into the corporate governance world. Uh, and to be honest, I mean, even though that the OECD had come out with their first uh, set of recommendations and, and so on, uh, the, the entire phrase of corporate governance at that time was uh, that was an unfamiliar creature uh, in Danish boardrooms. I mean, they, they looked at us in, in a kind of, you know, uh, weary way, and and uh, we, we then tried to rephrase it, and we talked about good corporate governance, so we, at least they understood that there was something that they needed to be good at. Uh, but Denmark <laughs> didn't have its first code of corporate governance until 2003, 
Uh, and even though when that eventually came into place, it was it was a rather mature uh, code. Uh, but still, I mean, this was four to five years uh, in advance of that. So you know, it, it was it was fun going out talking to you know very high level boards about something that they never thought about. Well, you know, fast forward, I spent ten years in in in, in that field. And then in uh, 2007, I, uh, I joined the executive search industry, and I've been there since. Um, today, I head up uh, the global uh, uh, board practice uh, for uh, InfoSearch, which is the ninth uh, largest uh, executive search company uh, in the world. Uh, we also have an American partner. Uh, which is uh, Charles Aris, uh, which is based in Greensboro, North Carolina. And along that way, you've been sort of continuing to build the network clearly into the boardroom and connect with all the right people, but you've clearly seen opportunities perhaps to add value and give back into the space. So, for example, like the Danish Professional Directors Association, something that, that you started. And perhaps you were giving us a little bit of hints before about there was not the organizational knowledge space that you'd expect to see. Can you tell us about why you founded that and what you've seen grow and develop as a result of it? Of course, happily. Um, you know, we, until 2012, uh, there was no such organization in place in Denmark. Uh, so we didn't have an NACD uh, or uh, an IOD, uh, as in the UK. Um, uh, but I, I clearly... Uh, thought that there was a need for that. Uh, so together with a you know few like-minded people, I set myself to start out the organization. Uh, and as it just so happens, I'm still uh, the chairman of, of the organization. Uh, so it's called Board Network, and it is the Danish Professional Directors Association. Um, our activity is uh, numerous. So we have... Uh, we have at least four annual conferences uh, with anywhere from 150 participants uh, and, and upwards. Uh, we publish a quarterly magazine called Board Perspectives. We do uh, an annual uh, global board survey, uh, and we uh, award uh, the, uh, the National Corporate Governance Award to, uh, to an outstanding corporate governance individual uh, <laughs> If, if, if you like. Uh, so a lot of uh, activities uh, in, in that space. Uh, alongside, uh, I've, uh, I've heard of a number of times people saying, you know, consultants, they're all very good. Uh, coaches, they're all very good. But what I really need uh, as an, you know, maybe you have a lot of experience as a CEO from a large organization, and, but now you're entering your first board role. Uh, and what you might want from that or, or to prepare for that it would be uh, some kind of mentor. Uh, and, and having heard that a number of times, I thought to myself, well, somebody should uh, should put that in, in, you know, in place. Uh, and with nobody else doing it, I, I, I founded that as well. So we have an organization called Board Mentors uh, where we have a curated panel uh, of uh, some 35 uh, uh, international board chairman uh, at a very, very high level uh, that you can access through that. And in addition to that, there's also the International Network for Corporate Governance and Board Leadership, where you're bringing together um, people from around the world. So chairman, non-executive directors, you've got events going on across the globe and clearly probably in different ways than you'd envisioned if we went back six months ago. Can you tell us more about what that group is doing too? Uh, yeah, well, you know, again, with a starting point in what we did in, uh, in, in Board Network, the Danish organization, uh, we were able to attract uh, quite high-level speakers uh, from all across the world. And, uh, and oftentimes, you know, our international speakers came up to me and said, somebody should be doing that uh, at, at an international level because, you know, they were enthused about the group that we were able to gather and not just, you know, from the speakers, but also from the participants. And, you know, with, with that kind of 
motivation. Uh, I thought to myself, you know, let's get like-minded people together. And, and so far, we've, uh, we've done uh, one event and, and are planning for, for more. So, yeah, uh, it, it, well, Corona uh, may have put a, a small halt uh, to, to the efforts there, uh, at least uh, at an interim level, but, uh, but I'm sure we'll... Uh, We'll be able to restart and we'll relaunch that uh, soon enough. So, Jacob, it sounds to me as if I were to summarize this up that you're basically on a personal crusade to spearhead the continuous professionalization of boards. Uh, and it sounds like you're really excited, you're energetic about it. And I imagine from your, your day job, and all of this stuff is in your, your part time, this is your passion project stuff, you are talking to people that are running non nomgovs committees, uh, chairmen of boards, CEOs, and you probably have your finger on the pulse for the way the board is changing. Now, obviously, COVID 19 is going to force some changes, but there were trends that were coming in before that. I'd love to hear some of your background and knowledge about where you think boards are going to be, perhaps in the short term, but also in the longer term. Oh, yes, well, you're absolutely right about that, Alexander. I'm, I, you know, I, I do a lot of stuff, but everything that I do is under the same headline, being the, the board agenda, and uh, you know, the, the professionalization of. Of boards uh, continuously, uh, and uh, and also you know improving corporate governance standards. That's also uh, always been my uh, you know my, my overall goal. Um, what I'm seeing right now is what was also discussed at the World Economic Forum uh, earlier in, in 2020, uh, and that was um, you know the entire concept of stakeholder capitalism. Uh, uh, I, I guess that it was phrased in another way, but but uh, equally uh, equally fluently by uh, by Larry Fink when he said, you know, companies need to have uh, a purpose beyond profit, uh, and I think that it, it, the the stakeholder capitalism idea uh, resonates in in the same direction, uh, and based on. Uh, the findings in our most recent global board survey that was out in March 2020, uh, we had a survey population of 1,592 uh, uh, chairs and non-executive directors from 72 different countries. Uh, and that all pointed in, in the same direction. Um, you know, we survey a lot of issues, uh, for instance, on mega trends and board trends and what have you. And, uh, and we do them every year. Uh, so over the course of the past four or five years, when looking at, for instance, the megatrends, uh, there has been one megatrend driving uh, the entire uh, uh, agenda, uh, and that's been uh, digitalization and disruptive technologies in, in general. But this year, actually, that was surpassed by another trend, and that's climate change. And, and uh, only last year, I mean, 2019, that didn't even rise to a top three position. Uh, so, so, so that's very, very interesting for me to see. That also meant on the board side that, you know, looking at, at the uh, most important board trends, uh, uh, again, it's always been digitalization and it's been digital committees and, and so on. Uh, but this year, again, this was surpassed by an, another trend uh, with an increasing focus on sustainability and the uh, and the purpose agenda. So that is, to me, a very very remarkable shift uh, in uh, in in the focal uh, or being a, the focal point for uh, for global boards. So if we just extrapolate on that, so let's call ESG, it's maybe a simple way to wrap our heads around it. Sure. 
It seems to me that some companies have fully embraced that as a key part of what they're doing. I used to work at J.P. Morgan, and Jamie Dimon has uh, big questions around sustainability as a society, and it's been a big part of what we did at the J.P. Morgan Corporation and our philanthropic work. Not all companies are necessarily bought into that. Um, clearly, during the COVID-19 situation, there have been some fascinating data that's been pretty obvious for a lot of people about the world and, and what is happening. So do you see that over the next, say, year or two that we will start to see boards work on this, talk about this, maybe even uh, how they hire their fellow board members to think about this differently? Absolutely. No question about it. Um, I think that over the course of the past 15 years, I mean, we've seen a global trend of increased globalization. uh, And I don't mean not necessarily only for uh, big companies, uh, large corporations, and so on. But I, I, you know, today every company, as small as it may be, uh, either has uh, global competitors or global vendors, uh, global shareholders, uh, or global customers, uh, and uh, so, so the entire uh, picture of of how that. The, the, the strategic picture for for any company uh, and and how which route to follow uh, that that has changed a lot. Uh, with globalization, is also coming uh, completely new competitive parameters. Uh, for instance, I mean, it, it, it can be very very hard for Western companies to compete on price because our cost of production is simply higher than what you can see in Asia. Uh, And that means that we have to also add something else to the table uh, to make it right for the uh, customers to buy from Western companies. Uh, And that is where, uh, among other things, that that ESG is uh, is being put into play. Uh, To to be able to go out and and, uh, elaborate for your entire stakeholders, uh, not just your employees and your shareholders, uh, but also to your to your clients and customers. Uh, what is it that you bring to the table of, in lack of a better word, of, you know, a greater good uh, for the world? And I know that that may sound uh, fluffy or maybe, you know, a mom and pop shop uh, somewhere, uh, you know, out on the countryside. But I think that it is increasingly uh, getting more and more important. Uh, so I see boards all over the place, uh, small boards, you know, companies with uh, five or ten billion dollars in turnover, all the way up to the really, really big uh, global players with more than twenty billion dollars uh, in turnover. Of course, they don't talk about it in the same way, but a lot of the items that they touch upon in their strategy planning, as well as uh, as in their annual board cycle, are actually the same. Hmm. Well, we can extrapolate from this conversation that the boards might need to engage an expert like yourself to say, okay, maybe we've never had someone on our board space before that has this background, this expertise. And we could go in a couple different directions. We're seeing trends about chief HR officers becoming uh, a sought after commodity. And I'm guessing what we'll see after COVID-19 is perhaps even more focus on that. So Jacob, pull us back the curtain a bit and help us understand, because when I think about your expertise, I'd actually put it into two buckets. I would say the board evaluation, where I see you as a really incredible expert to share with us today. And of course, the board search space. But why don't we start in the board evaluation? Because I don't think for many of our members, they would fully understand that. What is it like if an organization engages you to do a board evaluation? How would you go about doing that? Uh, well, uh, oftentimes, uh, a starting point for boards would be to do a self-assessment uh, of, uh, of the inner dynamics of the board work over the course of the past year. So that's very often what I've seen, that, that that's kind of the laying the grounds. And maybe, you know, a year or two later, uh, they want more dimensions and they want an outside-in perspective on, you know, how they are really working together as a board. And uh, in that sense, they uh, they can hire us or other consultants, but, you know, 
I'll just talk from my I'll talk about my personal experience here. Uh, we would do uh, we would start out by you know getting an understanding of the strategic plan, and with that in mind, we would try to map out uh, the correspondence between the uh, the competencies on the board and how that mirrors the strategic challenges uh, for the company. Uh, and that will obviously develop over time. So what could have been a very, very capable, very, very well-functioning and value-adding board five or ten years ago might not be a fit-for-purpose board today uh, mm. because the strategy has simply changed. So, so that is on the competency side. Second, we will dive into uh, how the, dynamic, the dynamics are being played out. Uh, and uh, we will do, first of all, a questionnaire, and that will consist of not only quantitative uh, questions, so typically scored uh, from one to five, uh, but also qualitative questions uh, on the individual contributions and also on the board as a whole. Uh, all responses recorded are done anonymously, uh, but all feedback is delivered unfiltered to the individuals. So there's a, there's an element of you know how you see the board working uh, as a group, but also on the individual contributions and individual uh, development points. And what I mean with the difference between the quantitative and the qualitative elements is that um, some eight or ten years ago when I when I uh, did the first board evaluations uh, it was uh, I guess it was more custom to only have quantitative uh, questions but I had an observation if I ask boards or board members uh, for instance the question from a scale, from well, on a scale from one to five how aligned are you as a board uh, on the company strategy? I never saw anyone score less than five. Every board member would say we are completely aligned on, on the strategy. All right. And then, you know, that, that kind of made me think, uh, can, can this really be right? Uh, and then I rephrased that into uh, three different questions. So that was, uh, what was the three most important decisions that the board made during the past year. Question number two was, what should be the three strategically most important uh, issues for the board to work with or work on for the coming year? And finally, uh, point number three, what, in your opinion, are the three largest risks facing the company as they are right now? And if I have a board of eight board members, I would say that I would usually get 24 different answers to all three questions. Right. Uh, and that is not alignment, right? And that is where I believe that most of the quality and value add comes in from, from the way that we do the evaluations, uh, because that that is really an eye-opener for most boards, and that is what can open up a conversation on how come that we are not as aligned as we originally thought. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, very good conversation piece, uh, and, and it adds a lot of value uh, to the boards. And, of course, you know, it, it all ends up in a written report with uh, very, very robust and firm re recommendations, uh, milestone targets, uh, follow-up points, and, and what have you. And most often, when we have been engaged in doing such an evaluation, we are rehired to do it again either the year after or, or two years after because, you know, simply our clients see that this is a kind of process that they get much more out of than, than doing a self-assessment or a let's say, a less mature kind of process. 
And I'm, I'm sure those insights lead to some analysis about ourselves as a board and the way we're going about things. And let's just sort of extrapolate it forward. And the board reassessed and said, okay, we are missing certain skill sets or we uh, need to pivot in what we're doing and how we do it. And they decide, okay, we're going to need to bring on another person or two of whatever this type. And then maybe they say, you know, Jacob, we've had such a great relationship with you. Help us to find that person. Can you sort of peel back that black box experience for our audience and say, like, what does it actually mean if you're going to say, oh, I have these board person, I have to go find them. Um, Some people think you're just looking on LinkedIn or you're just calling your own Relodex. Give us a sense for how that sort of search process works. Of course. Um, Of course, we have a starting point in our own database. But it's a little bigger than uh, than just the Rolodex. So I believe that we have just over thirty thousand uh, uh, candidate names in our database today, and not just names, but I mean the, the, the full profiles, right? And obviously, that's always our starting point. But again, I mean, thirty thousand is not that much in a global context. So that is not uh, the the only thing that we do. Let's say that we are asked to go out and find uh, a board candidate uh, with a CFO background. Uh, One of the things that we would do is that we would call upon trusted trusted sources uh, within our network uh, and to, you know, to identify people with a CFO background. We would usually call, for instance, accountants and bankers because those are the ones that most often have interactions with, uh, with CFOs. Uh, and we'll ask them a number of questions, but all pointing in the same direction as to, you know, who would be a strong candidate for a board position. Um, and we may call upon, let's say, 15 or 20 trusted uh, resources. And w- some might come up with one or two names, some might come up with 10 names. Uh, but depending on obviously your geographical scope and you know how, how many people that, that you're looking at and, and what kind of maybe uh, let's say industrial background you also need to have, and, and you might experience that some of the names are actually being brought up uh, more than one time. So more than one people, two or more people might might bring up the same candidate. That is usually a very, very strong pointer towards, you know, could this, uh, this person be a good candidate? And from there, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a developing process uh, all, all, all the way through the search cycle. Uh, the point where uh, a thought search differs mostly from a standard executive search is that we usually uh, do much more uh, desk research. So we try to find out as much as we can about potential candidates in advance. And then we contact uh, fewer people uh, in person. Um, it's, it, it's a bit more delicate to be, uh, be involved in, in, in a board search process. So if, if we had a in CEO search, for instance, we might have uh, uh, called upon forty or fifty people uh, uh, in in you know trying to cut our long list down to a short list. Uh, but in a board search, uh, that number may only be between fifteen and twenty. Uh, so you know it's it's a, a bit fewer people. Uh, on the phone, we'll get an understanding or as to, you know, uh, could this be an opportunity that you would be interested in and, and, and is there a match? And if both parties, I mean, us and the, and the potential candidate think that this could be a match, we'll meet up uh, on international searches. A first interview might be uh, through Skype or Teams or, you know, all the virtual tools that we have all gotten used to uh, use more. Uh, but but uh, on local searches, we would meet up in, in person uh, for the first interview. Um, and, you know, from there, it's it's a simple, a 
assessment, uh, we typically look for three things. Uh, one is what you could call for a candidate to get a foot in the door. That is having the functional and industrial competences uh, as, as, as the number one. So the competences. Uh, second, we are looking for the right character. Uh, and that is, you know, on the personal value side, uh, on on the integrity side. And then obviously we are also looking for, is there a right chemistry with the rest of the board? Uh, so competencies, character, and chemistry. And chemistry should not be mistaken for us not uh, looking to have a lot of diversity on the board because we we really, really are. That is one of our strong uh, assets, I guess. That, that is, we, we can usually bring much more diversity to a board than what they could do by doing a search themselves. Um, but, uh, I mean, even though that you're looking for diversity, and I mean that in the broadest sense possible, diversity of force, uh, you should have a chemistry because if you don't have chemistry, it might be impossible to even just agree on a common goal and a common strategy, and, and you don't want to end up in, in that situation. So, Jacob, I feel like you've really pulled back the curtain for us and given us a peek inside. And for many of our audience, they are on the journey of let's say, aspiring emerging board members of some might already be in the C-suite going, I'm ready, I'm prepared to take that next step. Others might be going, okay, I'm I'm about to open the C-suite door, so this is something that's going to happen in a year or two, and others are looking longer term earlier in their career. If we were to sort of package all this up and sort of tie with a pretty bow for people, what's the parting advice that you would have for these aspiring board members? How do they best position themselves so that someday down the line, when you're calling your trusted advisors to say, how do I find the right person on this board? There's someone who bubbles up as a name to be considered. Yeah. Um, Well, there are a number of proactive actions that you can actually take here. Uh, One is to um, make yourself visible. And a great starting point in that sense is to reach out to all the relevant headhunters or executive search firms that are involved in frequent board searches. That will vary from geography to geography, uh, but uh, you know uh, the likes of uh, Corn Ferry and Russell Reynolds and Spencer Stewart and DHR International, um, Hydric and Struggles, Egan Sender, and so on. Uh, they are active in, in, in most countries uh, and heavily involved in the board agenda. Uh, so, you know, uh, send your CV to those guys and make yourself available for a brief introductory call or meeting uh, where you can, you know, share your past experiences and your motivation, at least, to why you want to join the uh, uh, board eventually. Uh, so that's that's one thing. Second, uh, it is becoming increasingly more popular to take some kind of executive education uh, on a board program. And a lot of schools have great programs. Howard Business School runs one. Uh, Stanford has a number of, uh, of, of those programs. Wharton has one, uh, and, and so on and so forth. In Europe, you can see INSEAD and IMD all involved in that agenda. And I mean, they're all over the place. And most of the directors' uh, associations in, in each country also have programs. So, you know, I do that. Uh, get, a, get familiar with all the, the do's and don'ts on a regulatory side, uh, you don't want to be caught shorthanded uh, on the more formalistic side. And one way that you can actually you know, go out and claim that, you know, I am comfortable with all the formal sides of both work is by, you know, showing your certificate from a recent board program. Uh, However, in my opinion, the formal aspects of board work should be a lesser part. Uh, 
but the more value adding aspects that should come out from all your other experience that you have been able to uh, to gather in your career. But you know, go on one of those programs. I usually say that you know if if you do this right, you will get at least three things out of attending such a program. Uh, one is you know get more tools in your toolbox. You know. A, a, Acquire more knowledge, uh, get some more inspiration. Uh, so that's, that's the first part. The second part is that you will build a new uh, high-level network. If you attend the right program at the right school, you know, you will be in a room for, I don't know, four, six, uh, maybe ten days, depending on the program, with uh, very, very skilled people uh, and whom you can, you know, go to for advice, you know, where you can also provide advice uh, and who might be one of those that eventually will think of you as a proper board candidate if I myself or one of my uh, industry colleagues will call upon them and say, we're looking for a candidate with this and this profile. Can you name one? Oh, yeah, it was this guy or this woman that uh, I attended a, a program with. And finally, it, it it's you know, it's marketing material for your CV. Uh, I mean, something that you can put on your CV and 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 use uh, as a marketing tool. Um, second, uh, sorry, third, I would recommend that you join uh, a non-executive directors association uh, in your local community. Uh, it can be a, uh, uh, a nationwide uh, association like the NACD in uh, in the U.S., uh, or it could be of a more local uh, nature. But what you want to do here is that you want to place yourself in a new peer group. And this is a peer group of uh, board professionals or um, a, a board-accustomed uh, people. And you want them to start thinking about you, not as Irene, uh, the great marketing director, or John, uh, the very skilled CFO, uh, or Paula, the brilliant consultant. But you want them to think of Irene and John and Paula, uh, the board member. Uh, and you do that by you know, spending time with them and and getting them to uh, listen to you, listen to your input and what have you uh, at, you know, conferences and summits and workshops and, and so on. Um, finally, uh, you know, work actively on your so many channels, uh, especially on LinkedIn, obviously, uh, by posting, commenting on, uh, sharing, uh, liking uh, things uh, and articles that are board related. So that can be uh, a new uh, article coming out of Harvard Business Review. It can be a new book uh, on the corporate governance coming out on uh, Wiley. Uh, it can be uh, an article in Wall Street Journal on uh, diversity on boards. So Whatever, right? Um, if you do so, let's say once or twice or maybe three times a week, eventually you have notched all your connections enough so that they uh, subconsciously start thinking about you as Irene, John, or Paul, or the board member. Again, I mean you're 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 playing with uh, with their uh, um, perception of you. Uh, so that you are not just the marketing director or the CEO or the consultant, but also a potential board member. Uh, if I should name one last thing that, that you can do, and I know that, that that has been probably named by others as well, uh, when asked that question is that, you know, you, it's always a good idea to start by, uh, and to acquire board experience uh, on a, a not-for-profit board. Uh, it's usually easier because oftentimes it's uh, it's not paid work. <laughs> uh, so not that many people in line uh, to get those board seats. Uh, but 
it's still very, very educating. Uh, I highly recommend it. Um, but uh, again, in, in that sense, you are depending on somebody else uh, thinking that that's a good idea uh, for, for you to join that board. But the first four pieces of advice, uh, it's, it's completely in your own hands. Well, there you have it. One of the leading board executive search experts giving us his top tips on how we position ourselves. And Jacob, I think those felt very actionable to a lot of us. And I would like to point out, you've done a lot of these education courses yourself. It's not just something that you're touting others to do. You've gone to Harvard and Wharton and INSEAD and several others. So um, you're talking about that from experience as well. And I I feel like we could just be going on and on for, for hours of all this great content today. But you've given us all easy things that we can start to say, oh, I could do that. I can build that into my plans and prepare myself and educate myself. So thank you for being on the show today. We were delighted to have you here and we appreciate you sharing your insights and helping all of us to be boardroom bound. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Jacob, that was great fun. I just felt like we could have gone on for a couple of hours here. So I can tell you talk about yeah, this stuff all the time and it just comes yeah, off the top of your head. That was great. You've distilled that down very easily. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. It's, it's been a real pleasure. Um, it, it just wanted to have a full understanding here. Are we done with the, let's say, the formal part of the podcast now? Yes. Okay, I, okay, I just have one question for you. Sure. Uh, and, and, and that's more on a personal note. Uh, do you ever consider uh, speaking internationally? I, I actually love doing that. Um, it, my wife actually gives me a really hard time. I'm dual citizen, dual citizen U.S. and U.K. And she goes, "How come you're you've got a citizen of Europe and you never take me there?" <laughs> but I, I, I do love doing the international stuff. Yeah. Okay. Well, it, it's just um, one of the things that we do in uh, in the Danish Professional Directors Association is that we try not just to have mutual suspects uh, speaking. So, of course, I mean, as in any other country, uh, there are leading figures in the Danish corporate governance and, and, and board environment that, you know, are always popular to uh, to have speaking. But I always try to bring in several international speakers uh, that, that uh, our audience may not have met in another context in Denmark before. Um, so it was just, you know, if, if you would consider coming, uh, uh, and, uh, and second, if, you know, if we can find a, a suitable uh, subject or theme uh, that, that you would feel comfortable uh, talking over, because, I mean, well, we have our, uh, we have our schedule planned a year ahead, and I can send you, you know, dates and, and, and headlines for those summits, uh, you know, after after this uh, conversation. And, you know, if you would review it and maybe consider uh, if, if you would uh, be able to join us. Um, I, I would love I mean, that. That would be an honor. I appreciate you asking me. That would be great fun. And, uh, yeah, um, I mean, we've, we've had a few uh, speakers from the U.S. And, and also, I mean, we've had professors uh from, from business schools, um, and you know, obviously, we would be happy to you know cover all your travel costs and hotel, and, and also for your wife, for that matter, if if, if that could uh, increase the motivation. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I'm you know just just saying if if if, if you could find it worthwhile to uh, sure. to take the trip. But, but, you know, let me uh, suggest, uh, and if, if the dates and the, and the themes, and I mean, right now uh, with all the travel bans and what have you all over the sure. place, it's uh, sure. not easy to plan for. But, I mean, we could have this as an, as an ongoing, you know, item. Uh, and uh, if eventually there is a match between the theme and the date and your diary, uh, maybe that could be, uh, that could be uh, an opportunity. I, I would love that. It's, it's so funny from the beginning of the show. Just uh, it was easy for me to put myself mentally back in Copenhagen and just a beautiful city. And it was funny because I was telling you about that for my wife. She would jump at the chance for us to have an excuse to hop across the pond over to Europe. So um, I would love to come Fantastic. do that with you guys someday. That'd be great fun. Thanks, man. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, please uh, let me know when it's going to air, and I'll uh, obviously share it on all the platforms that I'm on and so on. And, 
I do believe that I have, I don't know, 28,000 followers on, on LinkedIn. So uh, I'll definitely make sure that it's available there. Well, thank you. I had great fun. I appreciate you giving up some of your precious evening time. I know you haven't had dinner with your family yet. So thank you for carving no, a little bit of time for us. This was a great episode. I really enjoyed it, Jacob. My pleasure. Thank you so much for asking me. That's it for this episode of Boardroom Bound. I really enjoyed chatting with Jacob Stengel. We were talking about someone who is a leading headhunter in the board space. Been there, done it, started all of the organizations, knows all the right people at the top companies. And he just told us in a very simple way, here's a platform, here's how you build your brand, here's how you make the reputation happen. Go get some of the right credentials, join the right organizations, um, make that information available to others so they begin to think about you in the right way. It sounded really simple, but it's very actionable steps for all of us to take. Now, remember to head over to podcast.gordon.edu where you can find links to everything that we discussed today. And please know that the Boardroom Bound team and I are so proud to be your go-to podcast for all things that connect, prepare, and empower you to land a board seat. Be sure to subscribe to this contest. Con- I guess we'll do a marker and should we start again? Okay, all right, Trey, we'll just pick this back up. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss any of the high quality content that we're bringing to you every Wednesday. Thanks for joining me today. I can't wait to share more stories and strategies from brilliant business minds with you again next week. Remember to keep tuning in to be boardroom bound.